We would like to welcome all of our viewers and listeners to another Vasculitis Foundation educational webinar. I'm Kathy Olevsky, the host for the Vasculitis Foundation's educational video series, but I'm also a patient living with vasculitis. I was diagnosed in, with ANCA MPA in 2008, and I was in treatment for six years, and I'm extremely grateful to have been in remission and off treatment completely for just over eight years. So today's webinar will be a Vasculitis Foundation Disease Insight webinar about giant cell arteritis. And I'd like to begin today by introducing our three guests. First of all, we have Dr. Daniel Demizio, who is an assistant professor of medicine at New York Presbyterian Columbia University Irvine Medical Center, which is CUIMC for when I start speaking about it again, where he serves as the director of CUIMC Vasculitis Center, of which he led development in 2020. Dr. Demizio has a particular interest in medical in medical education and additionally serves as the co-director of the musculoskeletal course for the medical students at Columbia University Vagilos College of Physical Physicians and Surgeons, as well as the course director for the rheumatology elective at CUIMC for internal medicine residents. And we also have a patient, June Bowman, who is from Nashville, Tennessee, and was diagnosed with giant cell arteritis in 2019. She's a retired registered nurse, and during her career, she held a variety of positions, including the chief, nur sorry, chief, chief nursing officer of an 800-bed hospital and chief operating officer of a four-hospital system. Her hobbies include gardening and quilting. And John Qualheim is 71 years old, and he was diagnosed with PMR in July of 2020 and subsequently diagnosed with GCA in June of 2021. He also deals with some issues resulting from spinal stenosis and he's been receiving monthly Actemra infusions since his GCA diagnosis. And he is a retired graphic designer and former runner. He and his wife lived 10 months of the year in Wisconsin and two months in Alabama. So welcome everybody. We, we Appreciate you being here, and we're excited to get to our topic right away. And with that, I think I'm going to turn it right over to Dr. Demizio and let you help us understand GCA. Thank you very much, Kathy. Let me just share my slides. So you should be seeing my screen, and I think you can see my mouse. Is that correct? We, we see everything great. Okay, great. perfect, perfect. Thank you for that introduction, Kathy. Um, and special thanks to Joyce Coleman and all the members of the Vasculitis Foundation for having me here today. You know, I'm, I'm very thrilled to have the opportunity to speak with you all and, and speak with June and John. So again, thank you uh, for having me. And again, my name is Daniel Demizio. I'm an assistant professor of medicine at the Columbia University Medical Center. And today I'm going to be presenting on giant cell arteritis. So here are my goals and objectives for today's talk. Uh, first, we'll aim to review the characteristic epidemiological, clinical, and laboratory features of giant cell arteritis, or GCA, as I'll call it, as well as polymyalgia rheumatica, or PMR, as I'll call it. Then we'll discuss current diagnostic strategies for PMR, as well as GCA, followed by a discussion regarding basic treatment principles for both of these diseases. And then finally, we'll review potential future diagnostic and therapeutic advances for the management of giant cell arteritis. And after the conclusion of my talk, we'll have some comments and some patient testimonials by June and John, and then we'll have some time, hopefully, for some question and answer. So uh, let's begin. As you're likely aware, giant cell arteritis is a disease entity falling under the classification of a vasculitis. So the best place to start is at the very beginning. What is a vasculitis? Well, a vasculitis is a class of diseases caused by inflammation of blood vessels. And the body has a dense supply of blood vessels ranging in sizes from large to medium to small vessels, with large vessels including things like the aorta and its major branches, down to the very small, the microscopic networks of the smaller vessels that are providing blood to our individual organs and our tissues. 
And the disease manifestations that we see in vasculitis are very systemic and are determined by three major factors. The size of the vessel that's being involved, whether it's large, medium, or small, the pathobiology of the inflammatory process, and the particular organs that are being targeted by the given inflammatory process. And in vasculitis, disease can occur in one or more of these vessel sizes. And before we begin our, you know, our discussion regarding giant cell arteritis, it's useful to just orient and review the methods by which we classify vasculitis. And in 2012, the International Chapel Hill Consensus Nomenclature were created and were an attempt to classify vasculitis, where essentially the different diseases were grouped on the basis of the size of the vessel that's being targeted by inflammation. So these were separated into large vessel vasculitides, the medium vessel vasculitides, and the small vessel vasculitides. And there's also a variable vessel that, a delineation that I won't necessarily get into. But today we're focusing on giant cell arteritis, which is a large vessel vasculitis, along with another one called Takayasu's arteritis. But it also includes things like a medium vessel va vasculitis, like polyarteritis nodosa and Kawasaki's disease. And then there's the smaller vessel vasculitides. Um, uh, Kathy had mentioned microscopic polyangiitis or MPA, which falls under that ANCA uh, category. And there's also the non-ANCA associated diseases, which is a large list in and of itself. But again, we'll be focusing on GCA. But before we speak about GCA, it's important that we talk about polymyalgia rheumatica, which I'll refer to as PMR. Um, although PMR is nearly two to three times more common, there's a lot of overlap between the two, and they frequently occur together. Uh, in terms of co-occurrence, approximately 10 to 20% of patients initially diagnosed with PMR will eventually go on to develop features of giant cell arteritis. Similarly, about 20 to 30% of patients who were initially diagnosed with giant cell arteritis will go on to or have concurrent symptoms of PMR. Although it's still pretty debated, uh, there is a frequent co-occurrence that we see here. And this has been a lot, meant, uh, led a lot of uh, experts to think, you know, is this one single unifying disease? Do they exist on, you know, a spectrum? But that is, you know, to be determined still. In terms of epidemiology, PMR, polymyalgia rheumatica, is a disease primarily affecting older individuals, typically older than 50 years of age. And it has an incidence of about 110 per 100,000 Northern European Caucasians, but at a higher rate in those Northern Europeans. Comparatively, it's uh, less commonly seen in some other ethnic groups. For example, as shown here, in uh, individuals of Japanese descent, the incidence is less than two per 100,000 individuals in Japan. So varies widely um, and still fairly rare. So what is PMR and how does it present? Well, the classic features of PMR are that of intense pain and stiffness of the musculature, particularly a pain and stiffness in the shoulders and the hips. Classically, PMR presents symmetrically or bilateral, affecting both sides, the right and the left side, though it may start asymmetrically, meaning it might start on one side and then bilateralize. In some cases, there might be concomitant arthritis, meaning it might have some pain in the peripheral joints like your hands or your wrists or your ankles or your feet. And importantly, in differentiating it from myositis, which is an inflammation, an inflammatory condition of the muscles, muscle strength is typically normal in PMR. So patients might you know, report some subjective weakness due to their pain. They might say, oh, I'm having trouble lifting my hands above my head, getting things out of a cupboard or getting up out of a chair or, or getting up out of off the to toilet bowl, for example. But by and large, pain and rigidity and feeling stiff are, are the major predominant uh, complaints. And that's kind of driving this reported weakness. And on exam, when a, when a physician examines the patient, they'll often note that although there is this subjective weakness, they really, you know, the muscle strength is, is quite preserved. In addition to this, this pain, um, constitutional symptoms or systemic symptoms might be present, such as fatigue, weight loss, malaise, low-grade fevers, and uh, all of those might be present in addition to the pain. 
Unfortunately, there's no confirmatory test. There's no single blood test that confirms PMR. It's a clinical diagnosis, meaning it requires kind of the whole picture, how the patient is presenting, their, their presenting features, their labs. But lab-wise, there are some tip-offs. And by and large, um, the elevated inflammatory markers you're hearing me talk about today, the erythrocyte sedimentation rate, or the ESR, and the C-reactive protein, the CRP, are very characteristic. They're often very elevated in PMR. And again, in differentiation from the myositis, that inflammatory muscle condition, the CPK, the creatine phosphokinase, and other muscle enzymes like ALT and AST, other tests that, that show if there's inflammation in the muscles, those would all be normal. And that helps the physician realize, okay, this is an inflammatory condition, but not necessarily a muscular condition. In terms of treatment, uh, this is again a clinical diagnosis and empirically a brisk and profound response to modest doses of prednisone are fairly characteristic in what we see. So the physician will often give a dose of 15 to 20 milligrams of prednisone and usually that, that provides a pretty quick response. In a lot of ways, PMR is one of my favorite diseases to treat because patients go, start feeling better pretty rapidly, typically. They're often going from feeling pretty awful, often for like weeks or months, just feeling really run down. And then you give them just you know 15 to 20 milligrams of prednisone and, and bam, they, they feel better within a couple of days. Not always, but, but that's typically the, the kind of course there. And it's always gratifying to have these patients feel be better really quickly. Um, the course, unfortunately, is, is a, a, a rocky one. So the steroids are tapered over months. So it's not like a one and done. These steroids have to be tapered pretty rapidly because PMR can and does tend to flare or relapse. And the steroids, again, are started at 15 to 20 milligrams, then tapered down gradually over the course of a couple of weeks to months. Um, pretty gradually at first, I would say about two and a half milligrams every you know, two or four weeks. And then once they reach kind of around 10 milligrams or so, then you go even slowly. And patients are on prednisone you know, for several months at this point, trying to get them lower on the prednisone and ultimately off ideally. Okay, so with that discussion of PMR out of the way, we'll move on to giant cell arteritis, which has a lot of similarities as we'll see. So giant cell arteritis, again, is a large vessel vasculitis that predominantly affects the thoracic aorta and its branches, including the temporal artery. Uh, the other name for giant cell arteritis is temporal arteritis because it tends to involve this temporal artery and its branches. It's also classically thought of as affecting the larger arteries above the diaphragm, including the thoracic aorta and its branches. So you could think of it kind of as an inflammatory large vessel vasculitis of the upper body above the diaphragm, but it certainly can involve other vessels as well. In terms of epidemiology, uh, GCA has an incidence of about 20 or more per 100,000 individuals. And like polymyalgia rheumatica, it's a disease primarily of older individuals, of you know, typically over 50 years of age. And it has a median age of onset of about 70 years or so. There is a slight female predilection. Uh, it is a ratio of about two to one with women kind of outpacing men here. Um, and with regards to racial and ethnic backgrounds, similar to PMR, there is likely some uh, genetic interplay um, as it's seen more frequently in Northern Europeans with that incidence of about 20 per 100,000 individuals. And that varies and is seen much less frequently um, in African-Americans, Hispanics, and Asians um, as shown here, but certainly does and can occur. So what is GCA? How does it manifest? Well, in terms of clinical symptoms, uh, they can be quite varied. So manifestations can be segregated into two major classes, cranial, meaning involving the vasculature in the head, or extracranial symptoms. And that stems for the involvement of the vessels outside of the head. So classic cranial symptoms include temporal or occipital headaches, so headaches on the side of the head or the back of the head, uh, scalp tenderness, so pain um, when combing our hair, pain when laying on a pillow or trying to put a hat on or, or shampooing our hair in the, in the, in the shower, um, jaw claudication or tongue claudication, so pain um, when chewing or fatigue of the jaw when chewing or pain in the tongue when chewing as well as ocular symptoms. So many, many ocular symptoms, diplopia being one of them or double vision, photophobia or light sensitivity, a transient loss of vision known as amaurosis fugax where you might lose vision for a second and the vision comes back, 
And unfortunately, the most feared complication, um, a permanent, abrupt, painless vision loss. In terms of extracranial symptoms, as we just recently discussed, uh, PMR is one of those such symptoms. And there also might be systemic symptoms, as we saw in PMR, such as fevers, chills, weight loss, malaise, might also frequently occur. If there are extracranial vessels that are being involved, like the thoracic aorta or the subclavian arteries that are in kind of the chest area. There might be a asymmetric loss of pulse. There might be differences in blood pressures um, in your arms. Patients might uh, complain of claudication symptoms, pain in one limb after repetitive use. And there might be bruits. Basically, when listening uh, to the blood vessels, there might be kind of this abnormal whooshing sound of blood that the physician notes. Now, on physical exam, findings might include things like scalp tenderness. So the patient might report it, but when on exam, the kind of touching of the head might elicit a lot of pain. Um, there might be temporal artery abnormalities, such as a reduction in pulse. There might be a firm, tender, hard as wood artery, the temporal artery kind of uh, supplying the scalp here on the side of the head. Very rarely, there might be complete necrosis or death of the skin being supplied by the temporal artery. So the scalp might get necrotic and, you know, the skin might be real dead and dark colored. Um, you might note some uh, asymmetric pulses or unequal blood pressures, as I mentioned, in the arms, or that, that auscultation of bruise, that, that abnormal blood flow sound, that whooshing sound of blood due to narrow blood vessels. As I mentioned, one of the feared complications is that of vision changes or even vision loss. Uh, the blindness is often abrupt, it's often painless, and it might be preceded by other symptoms. There might be some amaurosis, there might be that transient vision loss, there might be that blurry vision, there might be that double vision, but patients also can just abruptly and permanently lose their vision. That can be very scary. So patients are often quickly seen or referred to an ophthalmologist if they have a diagnosis or there's a suspicion for giant cell arteritis. And the eye doctor will look for evidence of what's called an AAION, or an arteritic anterior ischemic neuropathy. Essentially, it's a fancy word, but essentially on the back of the eye, they're looking for paleness, for a blurred dick, a disc that is due to lack of blood flow. As depicted here, as we see, this is what the eye doctor would see on the back of the eye. And there's a swollen pale disc of the, of the eye with areas of, uh, uh, of hemorrhage, of, of ble bleeding essentially. Fortunately, if GCA is recognized and steroids are started uh, quickly, we can often prevent that vision loss. And this is really good because if patients are started on steroids appropriately and started on steroids um, fast, uh, less than 1% of patients after steroids are initiated will have any sort of vision loss. So unfortunately, if it occurs, it's irreversible. But if we start steroids, we by and large prevent or, or diminish that risk of, of vision loss. Blindness, of course, is only one of the major feared complications of giant cell arteritis, but there are some additional complications that can certainly occur, and it really depends on what vessels, what vasculature is being involved. So although cranial involvement, that temporal artery or those branches of the temporal artery um, are involved, there are other extracranial vessels that might be affected, usually the thoracic aorta and its major branches, many of which are, are, are shown here. So a lot of names, a lot of complications, but essentially, you know, if there are certain vessels that are supplying certain organs, if that vessel is involved, it can lead to complications. So for example, the renal artery supplies the kidney and the coronary artery supplies the heart. So if either of those are involved by giant cell arteritis, it can lead to associated issues. So, so high blood pressure if the renal artery is involved or a heart attack if the coronary artery is involved. So of course, very varied and very scary, but um, you know, very effective treatments as we'll see um, coming up in just a few slides. How do these complications and issues arise? So in other words, how does GCA cause complications? How does it cause problems? So as we mentioned, GCA is a disease of those large muscular arteries, those larger vessels of the body like the aorta. So here is a histologic or a microscopic view of what one of those large arteries would look like if we looked at them under the microscope. And these arteries are, are um, organized into three primary layers, an intima, an inner layer where the blood is flowing, a middle layer called the media, 
and then the outer layer, the adventitia. And this medium is this middle layer. It's straddled by, by an internal and an external elastic lamina that basically is promoting compliance. It's, it's maintaining elasticity. It's helping the blood, the, the vessel uh, maintain and deal with high pressures of blood. And this organization is relevant to vasculitis because vasculitis can affect any one of these layers, if not all of them. And in the case of GCA, what we have is a pan arteritis. All three of these layers are being involved. The exact cause of GCA is, is not fully known. Um, a lot of hypotheses, a lot of um, thoughts and theories have been, have been proposed. There's a lot of information on this slide. It's, it, you know, it's again, a hypothesis. It's, it's mainly a theory. But I think you know, without spending too much time here, it's basically thought that a lot of the issue starts here in the adventitia, in the outside. So to orient you, um, here is the media. So the inner part where the blood would be would be kind of here in the middle. Here's the media. And then there's the outer adventitia. So early in disease, following some sort of unclear trigger, a stress or an infection, inflammatory cells like this one here, this immature dendritic cell minding its own business here in the adventitia is activated either by that stress, by that infection. And this activated cell basically raises the alarms and raises a red flag and it promotes the recruitment of even more inflammatory cells into the vessel wall. And some of those inflammatory cells are called macrophages. And those macrophages sometimes join up, they, they coalesce and they form what we call a multinucleated giant cell. That's how we get the name. So we've called it temporal arteritis, but the other name is GCA, giant cell arteritis. And the giant cells are these macrophages kind of coming together, grouping up and forming a giant cell. This mass influx of inflammatory cells leads to the release of a lot of different proteins, a lot of different cytokines and, and inflammatory products that basically destroy and degrade that elastic lamina, that compliance area of the vessel. And that leads to disruption and destruction of the vessel walls. And it leads to narrowing of the vessel wall and might even lead to aneurysm formation, dilation of the vessel wall. So again, this is a hypothesis, but what we do know is the inflammatory process is reflected serologically or, or through blood work. So what lab tests might be helpful in the diagnosis of giant cell arteritis? And in terms of laboratory analysis, similar to polymyalgia rheumatica, there's no single diagnostic or confirmatory test but there is often this elevation of the inflammatory markers, the erythrocyte sedimentation rate, the ESR, or the C-reactive protein, the CRP, and they're typically quite elevated. They're typically elevated quite robustly. Um, there are other suggestive labs, and it's all suggestive of this subacute or, or chronic or acute inflammatory state where we might see an anemia, some low blood counts, or we might see elevated platelets, a thrombocytosis. And all of this tells a story that there's some highly dysregulated um, inflammatory process going on that's driving or a byproduct of GCA. So with all that said, how does a doctor you know, make a diagnosis of giant cell arteritis? And it really can be pretty tricky. It can be pretty challenging. Um, there are classification criteria that were created in 1990 uh, by the American College of Rheumatology that basically tried to help in this conundrum. And, and they do perform very well, um, basically meeting three out of these five criteria, have a sensitivity of about 93% and a specificity of about 91%. But it should be noted these are classification criteria and they're not necessarily diagnostic criteria. So what's the difference? Well, classification criteria are used in research studies and are not necessarily used on a day-to-day -day basis in a, in a real world setting by doctors to make a diagnosis. But with that said, they can be useful. Um, they're used in research studies because they want all the patients in that research study to definitely have a diagnosis of GCA. But in clinical practice, it might not be realistic, but they're useful for clinicians because they guide physicians and they also help patients into keying in and focusing on kind of the, the key disease features. So what are some of these criteria? Well, having an age of greater than or equal to 50 years, having a new onset, new onset headache, particularly occipital back of the head or temporal headaches on the side, having temporal artery abnormalities, uh, having a firm or a tender temporal artery, having an elevated erythrocyte sedimentation rate greater than 50, or having an abnormal temporal artery biopsy. And in real world practice, 
the diagnosis of GCA ultimately hinges on that last criteria, the, the temporal artery biopsy, which in the United States remains the gold standard. If a physician suspects giant cell arteritis, all patients really should be sent for a biopsy of the temporal artery. With that said, and I really can't stress this enough, very important, if the patient has ocular symptoms, if there's vision loss or vision blurring, and it's being considered that GCA is the cause, we do not wait to start steroids. We start those steroids very early because there is a benefit. We, we know that if we start steroids, we can, we can you know, basically prevent vision loss. So while there is a theoretical risk those steroids might alter your biopsy, that doesn't happen for many, many weeks, over two to four weeks of being treated on steroids. So we don't delay getting the biopsy to confirm the diagnosis. We treat first and kind of ask questions later due to their you know, potential vision saving role. Historically, temporal artery biopsies were done um, bilaterally, meaning both sides, as the disease you know, can be missed easily on biopsy. It tends to be a little bit patchy. But recent guidelines actually recommend unilateral over bilateral biopsies unless the disease is not clearly localized. If you can't really determine, oh, it's only you know, on the left side, maybe then it more is useful to get both. On biopsy, what we see is evidence of that pan arteritis affecting all layers of the vessel. So, you know, here we see some giant cells, those macrophages that are coalescing. We'll see disruption of that internal elastic lamina, and we'll often see narrowing of that vessel. So here on the left um, of the screen, we have a, a kind of a normal vessel, and all the subsequent uh, pictures here on the right are all very stenotic or, or narrowed vessels with disruption of that, of that normal vessel vasculature, and that's leading to kind of all the problems that we see in GCA. In addition to lab tests and temporal artery biopsy, imaging tools are being increasingly utilized to assist with diagnosis and can even you know, help clinicians very much in diagnosing tricky cases of GCA where there might be an inconclusive or a negative temporal artery biopsy, but there's a high concern, despite that negative biopsy, there's a high clinical concern for maybe extracranial giant cell arteritis or, or a false negative biopsy. Such imaging modalities that are kind of rising in prominence are that of a temporal artery ultrasound, having a magnetic resonance angiography, an MRA, having a computed tomography angiography or a CTA, or having an FDG PET scan, for example. And these same imaging modalities are being increasingly useful not only in diagnosing the disease, but also assessing disease activity. So for patients with known giant cell arteritis, it's useful, you know, is that patient still in remission? Is that patient having a relapse? Is there still ongoing disease? So a lot of interesting research and studies that are coming out about these uh, imaging modalities. And the treatment of GCA is very nuanced, and I won't necessarily go into every aspect of you know, what medications are being used and, and at what doses, but I'm gonna speak in pretty broad terms and review some of the more common treatment pathways. Uh, the treating provider will often consider a lot of aspects, you know, how the disease is presenting, how severe it is, and, and what organs are, are being involved. Um, the provider will give special consideration to specific, you know, individual characteristics such as, you know, the patient's age, their sex, their risk factors, other disease comorbidities they might have, um, medications they might be on, um, and also, you know, having a real heart to heart with the with, with the patient. You know, making sure that all treatment considerations are in line with the patient's beliefs, with the patient's preferences, you know, their individual needs. But with all that said, time really truly is of the essence. You know, we can pre pre you know prevent vision loss, for example. And as mentioned, particularly if there is that eye involvement or high concern for eye involvement, treatment will often occur immediately with those high doses of intravenous steroids, even before the diagnosis is confirmed. But unfortunately, as we discussed, you know, GCA is a relapsing disease, meaning it will frequently come back, it frequently flares. So after initial therapy, there really needs to be a careful balance of, you know, that risk of relapse and the potential risk of side effects of toxicities from our therapy. So really weighing the pros and cons of the risk of the disease coming back and all the things that can happen, excuse me, because of that and the risk of toxicity. So this is a busy slide, but in terms of management, like PMR, steroids are the cornerstone of, for the treatment of giant cell arteritis. And the major branch point here is whether or not there is eye 
or critical organ involvement. If there is any concern for vision loss or other major, major organ involvement, patients will immediately be transferred to the hospital where they receive high-dose intravenous steroids followed by high-dose oral steroids. Recent guidelines recommend early initiation of a medication called tocilizumab, or the trade name is Actemra, and this is given in conjunction with steroids, not given alone. Tocilizumab is a medication that's typically injected under the skin, but it can also be given uh, intravenously. It can be given uh, under the skin basically every week or intravenously every month or so. And it specifically targets molecules that are known to be involved in gi giant cell arteritis, namely a protein called IL-6 or interleukin-6. This combination of tocilizumab with steroids has been shown to be very effective in treatment of giant cell arteritis and achieving clinical remission. And it basically uh, permits gradual tapering of steroids with a much lower risk of flare. Labs should be checked periodically while on prednisone and tocilizumab, and then the prednisone is gradually tapered to off. And there, there should be frequent monitoring with your provider and, and checking in with your provider, I would say initially early, you know, monthly or so, and then kind of spacing it out maybe to every two or three months or so. And the inflammatory markers, such as the ESR and the SED rate, are usually decreased um, rapidly, as well as the clinical symptoms. So pe people get better pretty quickly. But uh, these are monitored to make sure that the disease is not coming back and can serve as markers of disease activity. One of the common questions that a rheumatologist will get is, am I going to be on this medication for life? Unfortunately, giant cell arteritis is a chronic disease that entails ongoing management and careful vigilant for disease relapse. Relapses are common, and about 30% of patients will relapse as the dose of steroids are lowered. But continuous, indefinite, forever treatment with immunosuppressives is, you know, with steroids, with tocilizumab, is absolutely not required for all patients. As mentioned, we know that the combination of tocilizumab, Actemra, with steroids is very effective in gaining remission and maintaining that remission. But how long, the, the optimal duration of treatment with, with tocilizumab, that remains kind of an area of, of active research to this day. So studies such as the one depicted here are, were published just about a year ago in May of 2021. And what it shows, again, kind of a complicated slide, but it shows that 73% of patients who achieve clinical remission after one year of weekly Actemra plus six months of steroids, a little under half of them, about 42%, maintained tocilizumab and steroid-free remission for another two years being on no medications at all without a flare of their GCA. So that was, that was kind of a complex ex explanation. What does that mean? Basically, if you're treated with tocilizumab for one year and with steroids tapered gradually over that one year, about a little bit less than half of patients will not have any issue, no flares of their GCA. But that does mean that about 60% of them has some sort of issue. So no, you don't necessarily need to stay on medication forever, but at least one year of treatment is recommended. And the optimal duration thereafter to minimize risk of flares is a little bit unclear. And it really requires a very thoughtful, a very clear and, and, and you know, focused discussion with your provider, determining kind of your risks and uh, the, the benefits of coming off versus stopping that medication. So finally, where are we headed? What does the future look like with regards to giant cell arteritis? Um, as mentioned, there's ongoing research into ideal duration of therapy to balance the risks of potential toxicities and the risk of relapse. Steroids and tocilizumab remain the backbone of initial therapy, but as we mentioned, there's a lot of research into looking at, at two other medications, the optimal duration, are there other, other medications, other infusions, other oral medications that might prove to be beneficial. Finally, as previously mentioned, there's ongoing research into optimal and less invasive ways to diagnose and monitor disease, things like CT angiography and MR angiography, ultrasound and PET scan. And these are really useful tools in monitoring that disease activity. There's also a lot of research into new blood tests, novel blood tests that might be useful not only for diagnosis, but also monitoring your disease activity, much like we use the SED rate and the CRP. So in conclusion, GCA and PMR are two closely related diseases that may exist on a spectrum. Patients with PMR experience symmetric pain and stiffness in the shoulders, the neck and hip, 
along with low-grade fever, malaise, and fatigue. Standard treatment is low-dose steroids with a gradual taper. GCA should be considered in any individual over the age of 50 with temporal or atypical headaches, jaw claudication, or visual changes. Although temporal artery biopsy is indicated to definitively diagnose GCA, initiation of high-dose steroids should not be delayed. Treatment can prevent blindness, and biopsy specimens are interpretable for up to two to four weeks even after treatment. And tocilizumab with steroids is currently the first-line treatment for giant cell arteritis, but the optimal duration of treatment is not clear. And finally, I provide here a few resources for some of the patients or, or family members who might be watching. You know, great resources, of course, for, you know, include the, the Vasculitis Foundation. There's a lot of educational uh, content, a lot of research studies, a lot of support groups, and, and other you know, educational content such as these. Um, I'd also like to direct your attention to another one of these webinars given by Dr. Augusto Vaglio. It was given on November 1st on 2021, and it's on the topic of aortitis. And it includes a lot of information about aortitis, which includes giant cell arteritis. Um, and there's a lot of other educational content that be, can, can be found with the American College of Rheumatology at www.rheumatology.org, at the Arthritis Foundation, arthritis.org, and the European Vasculitis Study Group, UVAS, at vasculitis.org. And with that, I conclude the lecture portion of today, and I'll, uh, you know, we'll hear from some additional guests, and I'll hand it over to, to Kathy.